country farmland views. There's not too many of them left anymore, but welcome back to the Sunshine State Rails. Today, these farm country roads would take us out into the dead center of the Sunshine State, over to a short line that I hardly ever visit anymore, the U.S. Sugars Railroad. They'd have quite the special events set up for this Saturday, so we'd make the two and a half hour drive out to the town that I visit even less than the railroad, Sebring, Florida. And here's our destination, the Sebring Amtrak station. We're here with a uh, private Amtrak move on the way up from Miami right now with uh, eight private cars in tow. These cars are on their way up here to Sebring as a uh, special move chartered by the AAPRCO. They're having a private charter this Saturday down onto the U.S. Sugar System down to Clewiston today, this Saturday, April 23rd, under the uh, glorified title, the Sugarland Limited. These eight private cars are on their way up here, and they're also going to have their newly restored Miami locks on the front of this excursion down to Clewiston, which is a one of the newly restored baggage cars from U.S. Sugar. And powering this whole excursion is going to be their 462 type steam locomotive number 148. 148 was originally built by Alco back in April 1920. Actually used to be native to the U.S. sugar system, but then it got out into the U.S. But then it was restored from almost nothing starting in 2016. And then in 2020, the locomotive was unveiled. It's been out for a couple years now, and it's apparently gathered the attention of the AAPRCO. They're doing a whole excursion based around that today. It's also cool to be back at the Sebring Amtrak station. I haven't been here since 2016 either. They've actually extended the platforms down from the station in either direction. It's just after 10 a.m. now, so see how it goes. I'd move back up to the Sebring Parkway Road Crossing, where the South Central Florida Express trackage branches off of the CSX Auburndale subdivision. This is where the Amtrak special move would come to a stop and interchange with the 148 on the U.S. Sugar tracks. At 12.04 p.m., P96823 rounds the curve into downtown Sebring with engineer Kyle Myers riding the brakes into the Sebring stop. Over top the Sebring station platforms, it's quite the sight to see all these historic cars sitting in the station, as who's to say that they haven't in revenue service at some point before along their lifespan. But now under private ownership, these cars have a new lease on life and are available for certain private charters and events like these, but you can only ride these events if you're a member of the AAPRCO and have a fair bit of cash in your pocket. The interchange onto the South Central Florida Express would have to be a backing move. CSX, for whatever reason, doesn't want this kind of steam touching their tracks, meaning that P968 would have to shove the private varnish back through the short lines interchange, and so the CSX dispatcher in Jacksonville has already lined the interchange switch, and since signal territory ends here going onto that track, the best signal that Amtrak can get leaving the CSX main is a restricting, which tells the crew to pass this signal not exceeding 15 miles per hour or any speed that they can't stop within half the range that they can see ahead of them. This is in case there are any obstructions on the track, because going on to the SCFE, there are no dispatcher controlled signals beyond this point. So the conductor on the bottom of P968 takes that signal and backs the train down onto the South Central Florida Express. Headed south today, the eight private cars in our train would be the Illinois Central Corridas, the Frisco Cimarron River, the Northern Sky Charters, Northern Sky and Northern Dreams Pair, the Seaboard Hollywood Beach, the Pennsylvania Francis L. Sutter, the New York Central Portland, and the Chesapeake and Ohio Chapel Hill. This Amtrak Viewliner coach was not going to be a part of today's charter. It was only on the train so that when Amtrak ran the locomotives back to Miami, they could run at full speed because a certain rule in place restricts the speed of light locomotives unless they're pulling something, in which case they would be. Something else interesting to think about as 968 crosses Sebring Parkway is that this is, to my knowledge, the first time that anything Amtrak has been on the South Central Florida Express rails. The train was shoved about 2,000 feet south of the interchange switch, 
right up to the Sebring water tower, as that was as far as they needed to go to get off any crossings and to be fully on the USS Sea tracks, where plenty of folks would pull over for some trackside photography. Myself included at the Kenilworth Boulevard crossing for today's main event. Steam locomotive number 148, shoving itself and the Miami locks down onto the AA PRCO Sugarland Limited. The two crews would then go through the tedious procedure of connecting 148 and their renovated baggage car to the entirety of the private consist. And even here in Sebring, it's clear to see just what a crowd simply social media word brought about for this train. The public online schedule posted by the AAPRCO had our train departing south from Sebring at just before 1 p.m. Although they were a little later than the posted 12.45 departure from Sebring, they were on the move by just before 2 p.m. And so, I moved down to the southernmost crossing of Sebring Parkway, where the SCFE trackage swings back across the road and into the citrus fields. I'd take up the one spot that I could find open here, the very top of an embankment. And I can't say I'm too disappointed with what a vantage it was. As 148 pulls out of Sebring with the longest passenger consist the engine has pulled to date. On the very bottom, the Chapel Hill is sporting a custom-made emblem for today's trip, which includes the title and sponsor of today's run. As the train curves off into the citrus fields, I had plans to try and get ahead of as many people as I could to set up for our next spot, which would arguably be one of the most popular along this chase. But many residents and visitors to Lake Placid had that idea well ahead of me. The spot was already packed when we arrived, and although the train snuck up on us, I do have to admit it was worth the stop. 148, gliding across the Welcome to Lake Placid Bridge over US 27. <laughs> Similar to past U.S. sugar passenger excursions, the train would have a pit stop to make at the Lake Placid Depot. Here they'd pull the train onto the tiny siding to allow passengers to disembark the train with a plethora of concessions available here for their two-hour layover, most primarily barbecue. The train didn't have to stop before coming into this siding as the switches were already lined in and out of it before they got here. Why? We'll explain that later on. Personnel from FMW Solutions were here inspecting 148 to make sure she was fit for our trip to Clewiston, adding grease to the piston rods, and hooking up a water hose to a nearby fire hydrant to refill the boiler. Steam is made by boiling water, and although the engine burns vegetable oil nowadays, that stuff still gets very hot, and a lot of water is needed to keep that boiler cool. Car inspectors would also take the stop to check the train for any problems that might come up later down the road. All the while, family members of all ages had come out to the depot to get a look at today's train and beauty of a steam locomotive in the front. Laid over in the caladium capital of the world, 148 really has become the public image of this railroad. Moving towards the bottom end of our train, I'm going to take a look at two of our private cars as they spike the interest of either me or a general population. One of the most famous private cars in today's consist is the Seaboard Hollywood Beach. Built by Pullman for the Seaboard Airline in 1956, the car served on their premier train, the Silver Meteor. 
The Hollywood Beach was built as a sun lounge, which was Seaboard's version of a dome car, but without any extended height like the northern sky in today's train, so the car could fit through tunnels into New York City. The car then switched owners a few times across the merging of railroads before becoming a part of Amtrak's fleet of cars in 1971. Amtrak then retired the car in 1981 before it was sold into its private ownership eight years later, at which point it got a full refurbishment and upgrade, those which it still holds today as part of the AAPRCO's fleet. And coincidentally, right behind the Hollywood Beach would be my favorite car in the train today, the Pennsylvania Railroad Francis L. Sutter. Built for the Pennsylvania Railroad in 1914, this is the oldest operating private rail car in America. In 1971, this car was sold directly into its private ownership and still retains many of its original features, such as a wood-burning fireplace and marble countertops. The car has also been certified by Amtrak for 110 mile per hour service. And on top of it all, I actually saw this car on our recent trip up to Altoona, Pennsylvania. On our second to last day, the Amtrak Pennsylvanian coming across the Brickyard Crossing would have this car on the very bottom. And now, four months later, it's sitting on the U.S. Sugar Tracks in Lake Placid, Florida. I see 148 to that release 2. Release 2 to that 148. Alright, release 2. About to pull away from Lake Placid side. Getting them blocked, though. Pulling out of Lake Placid side, getting the block. He's coming by the 9th, 10th now, northbound. Got 40 behind me, headed to the top. Alright, copy that. We're pulling away from Lake Placid side, and we're gonna stop the shorter child. Alright, copy that. Pulling away from Lake Placid, we're gonna stop the shorter child. Guys, we're gonna stop the boys, I know. Now at quarter to 5 p.m., 148 is on the straight shot south to Clewiston. That radio conversation beforehand was a conversation between 148 and Relief 2. Now going into this next bit, it might be important to note U.S. Sugar's ID system. For the part of it that's about to concern us, the regular cane jobs that bring sugar cane to the mill at Clewiston or other places are usually cane and a number. Now, these IDs don't necessarily denote where a train is going to or coming from, but it is the ID they give them. But as we'll come to find out shortly, Relief 2 is not a train. Headed south a ways, just south of the curve at Bear Point Lane, things would draw to an unexpected halt. As the radio conversation told 148 that they were to stop just north of Childs, which is just south of where we are now. Upon our wait here, we'd all turn south to see the unmistakable LED headlights of a USSC locomotive, which visually announced that an empty cane train was coming up this way and was to pass our crossing. Jeep 40 number 506 was in the lead. Trips to the U.S. Sugar Railroad involving 148 always introduce the opportunities to catch these cane trains, and it's always an extra treat when you do. It's never a disappointment to get a look at the custom-built cane cars, which have opening side doors and sets of three that open for super-fast dumping of cane. It looks like these were either custom-built or renovated from old boxcars or bulkhead flats. In any case, there's no other cars anywhere else in the U.S. like them. The Kane train, under the symbol Kane 4, begins shoving backwards into a loadout about a thousand feet south of us. This is the place that they were talking to 148 about. Childs is the name of this sugarcane loadout. Train Kane 4 would have to come north of the loadout and shove their empties down into it. The entire move was done as efficiently as possible in front of 148, all possible because of Relief 2. Uh, was that sarcastic or was that serious? No, that's, that's a very good train handling. Good job, sir. Copy that. Thank you. You're very welcome. Credit to do or credit to serve. That was nice. 
As I said before, Relief 2 is not a train, but Relief 2 is rather the identification for an employee in a road vehicle running up and down the line getting things ready for trains on their way to certain places. This is why beforehand, 148 didn't have to stop to line any switches in or out of Lake Placid siding. The person in the truck of Relief 2 had already done that for them before they got there. And such is also true here. Relief 2 was always in contact with Kane 4 because Relief 2 was on the ground throwing the switch for 506 to shove backwards instead of the train's conductor. It's an interesting design, but it's definitely economical and as shown here, very efficient and made it so the 148 was only delayed by about six minutes or less. And soon enough, they were right back on the move. Across State Road 8, the smoke billowing into the air across the field of Florida Palms made for what could arguably have been my favorite shot of the day. Pacing our favorite cars to the bottom of Highlands County and then into Palmdale, 148 kept chugging along with no time to waste. Eighteen miles later and the train slows to a crawl across the swing span of the Caloosahatchee River in Moorhaven, the Caloosahatchee being the main waterway leading out from Lake Okeechobee into the Gulf of Mexico. SCFB relief to the K2 over. Two, go ahead. Yes sir, just come over 27 for Hammock. Can we get back into that Moorhaven block over headed to the bill? Our next turn southbound would be onto State Route 720, and now, south of Moorhaven, we are squarely in sugarcane country. Although it is late April, meaning that harvest season around here is coming to a close, so pretty much all of the sugarcane around here has already been harvested, which is why it doesn't really look like anything is growing around here. It's all been replanted. It'll all regrow over the summer, which will lead into next harvest season starting around October. We'd run about four miles down the curved, cracked, and crooked road, then turning out into the cane fields, out to a spot called Liberty Point. Named by the railroad for a large sweeping curve that cuts through the cane fields, there was reportedly going to be a photo run by here, although due to how late the train now was, that would get cancelled last minute. Arriving at Liberty Point across the cane fields, things would spricen up here too. As per the radio conversations back at Moorhaven, Job Kane 2 would be pulling loaded cane cars out of a loadout named Bimbo 1 and back to the Clewiston Mill. The harvested sugarcane fields allow us to see this train coming from miles away. Leading the train would be a solo Jeep 11 number 311, and with a loaded cane consist right behind, this train would really go to show the appeal of Liberty Point. The 
the decision was made to run this train out in front of the Sugar Land Limited back to the Clewiston Mill. Because as operations manager Scott Ogle put it, these guys are the money makers, so these guys have priority. That's the mobile, mobile to the 148 over. Yes, sir. Kenny, we got a game time decision. You guys got time to do this run by or do we need to roll on, sir? We don't have time to do it, cop. Understand, scratch the run by. Thank you, Kenny. And just like that, the run by was scratched. But four and a half minutes behind Kane 2, USSC 148 and the Sugar Land Limited would pass across the same field and round the same curve as the train before them. The flat, completely open sugar fields and the giant sweeping curve of Liberty Point would beautifully stretch the train's consist out into the continuously lowering sunlight. <laughs> Across State Route 720 one more time, and the Sugar Land Limited is just a handful of miles out from today's destination, the U.S. Sugar Small Rail Yard at their North Shops, which is precisely where we'd go, off the sidelines of Aztec Avenue, as the private varnish rolls across W.C. Owen Avenue and into their stop to tie down for the night. This would draw an end to day one of the AAPRCO's Sugar Land Limited. From Miami to Sebring to Clewiston, these eight private cars have traversed almost 243 miles of track across two different railroads, all within the last 12 hours. The AAPRCO Sugar Land Limited was set to be a five day long event to where they would pretty much tour the entirety of the US Sugar and South Central Florida Express systems as all of the track that the United States Sugar Corporation owns is split between those two railroads. They'd service the consist here in Clewiston overnight and put 148 in the yard before starting the day early tomorrow and continuing their journey through the cane fields. This was all for me to shoot of this train though, and I am very pleased with how it came out. On our way back out of town, the guys invited us to a dinner at Sonny's Barbecue, but I'd be just a few minutes late to that party as I knew that one more train was coming south towards Clewiston that I figured I'd go out and shoot. Pulling up to the spot I had in mind, not a 10 minute wait reveals the unmistakable LED lights shining across the crops. Remember that Kane 4 from up near Lake Placid at the Child's Elevator? Well that train was also to pick up loaded cars and bring them back to Clewiston, and by now, they're getting back down here. By this point, the sun has since dipped below the horizon, but those LED lights on 506 more than adequately illuminate the right-of-way ahead, bringing to a clear, fluorescent light our last train movement of the day.
As 506 hauls the last load under Twilight to the mill, I'd like to thank everyone who made an appearance this day for making today a success. I'd also like to give a personal thanks to Richard Rafalski for help with a lot of the infographics and information for this video, and also to the AAPRCO, US Sugar, and staff for both organizations for making all of this a successful operation. We'd pack it all up and head to Sonny's for dinner before I'd get to make the two hour drive back home under darkness. But by the time of editing this, that's all said and done. So I thank you for watching, and in Clewiston, Florida, this is Coda Maynard, and I'll see you next time somewhere on the Sunshine State Rails.